Well, good morning. I'm uh, Michael Morkin. I'm an emergency doctor at Renowned Medical Center, which is the trauma center for northern Nevada and a good piece of northern California. I was asked to come today and speak about the Reno Air Race disaster, which happened about a year and a half ago. Before I talk about that, though, I'd like to talk about the other Reno Air disaster. For people who have been in the area for a while, you'd probably remember that as a galaxy crash that happened back in 1985. Um, Galaxy Air was a charter company that had been contracted to fly a Super Bowl party back from Lake Tahoe, leaving Reno Airport to Minneapolis-St. Paul. And they had chartered a plane, which was a turboprop passenger plane, total capacity between the air crew and the passengers was about 70 people. Turboprops are a little odd in that, at least to me, because I'm not a pilot, that the engine needs to be given an assist during the takeoff process to get up to speed, and that's done by compressed air, and each of the engines is given a jet boost of compressed air during the takeoff pro pro uh, process to get up to takeoff speed. The compressed air is held in a tank on the wing, and this tank obviously needs to be refilled from time to time. This was done on the ground in Reno before takeoff, and just before the plane was about to leave the jetway, one of the ground crew noticed that the hose was still attached to the fitting in the, in the wing. They stopped the plane from backing away. One of the ground crew went out and appropriately removed the hose from the fitting. But unfortunately, the access plate, which is a 12 by 18 inch or so piece of metal, was not secured properly. The plane then went to take off left the ground and immediately this plate started vibrating, a lot of noise and vibration, right wing, that the pilot and flight crew could feel and they were very concerned this might represent some kind of catastrophic engine failure. It's felt that they meant to power down the number three engine, which would be the engine closest to this plate, and unfortunately it appears they powered down all four engines and the plane stopped flying and crashed just south of town about the area now where 395 crosses over South Virginia Street. Uh, now that area is pretty well built up. Back then it was pretty much sagebrush and jackrabbits and the plane impacted in a field. Uh, there were initially three survivors of the about 70 people on board. Two of the survivors died of their injuries shortly thereafter in a local hospital. The, there was one survivor, a 17-year-old male, who was actually found strapped in his seat about 100 yards away from the impact site. He had no really significant physical injuries. Well, why talk about this in terms of a disaster? From a medical point of view, it's not really much of a disaster at all. It was horrible what happened, but there were only three people transported. At that time, what is now renowned was Washu Medical Center. It was the trauma center. They were seeing about 100 to 120 patients a day, adding two or three patients, no matter, no matter how badly they might be injured. Wouldn't really change the operation of the emergency department. What, what went poorly was at the scene. Uh, the first responders, meaning fire department, ambulance, law enforcement, all felt things didn't go very well. They noticed that there was a lot of duplication of effort with a bunch of people trying to do certain things and kind of getting in each other's way, and a lack of things being done by anybody that very much needed to be done, and they felt we could do better. And so a committee was formed, and it's evolved over the years, but the committees continued in place, and the committee consists of the first responders, which I mentioned, but also medical personnel and hospital administrative staff who meet monthly and try to improve disaster care in northern Nevada. We wanted to make sure, I should say they wanted to make sure because I didn't show up until about 1995, that if anything like this ever happened again, it would go better. And individually, they set it up so each group is responsible for your own piece of the problem. In other words, I don't know anything about traffic control, I don't really want to be involved with that, and so we'll let the law enforcement people do that. The law enforcement people aren't terribly in concerned about how I'm going to take care of sick people. I'm going to take care of that. Now, we do interface with each other. The doctors interface with the paramedics. We need to work together. Paramedics need to work with law enforcement. They're both involved in moving people from the disaster scene to the healthcare facility. But each group is tasked with their piece of the pie, and they're given a great deal of latitude in how they solve their problem. And all we look for is an assurance that 
they're comfortable that they've fixed their issue. So that brings us to this. About a year and a half ago, Reno Air Races, obviously that's bad. On the last lap of a race that involved four World War II vintage propeller-driven aircraft that were highly modified, plane lost control, turned over, and impacted into the tarmac immediately in front of the North Grandstand. That's bad, and that's worse. Essentially, this is a bomb going off very close to these people in the grandstand. Uh, initially, it was felt this might have been some sort of medical problem with the pilot. He was over 70 years of age, but with some films that they were able to get from people who were at the accident, it seems pretty clear that this was a catastrophic mechanical failure of the plane. The pilot was unconscious and had no control over the plane when this occurred. Plane impacted next to the North Grandstand. Uh, there were seven fatalities at the scene, including the pilot. About 60 badly injured patients, or people, who needed to be transported as quickly as possible to the trauma center and other hospitals in the area. Paramedics immediately go to work. The first thing they do is they triage people. This You sort out people by how sick they are, basically, because you want to move the most seriously injured people first. While that's going on, think about what happened here. If you know anything about this area, north of town, it's about 12 miles out, you drive up 395, which is a major highway, you get off a two-lane road and you go to the airstrip. You now have 30,000 people who are out at this event who want to be anywhere but there. They're all going to their cars, they're getting on 395 south and coming back to Reno. That's where we have to get patients to the hospital. This isn't going to work. That's a traffic jam. Law enforcement seizes control of 395 North at Mill Street, which is near where the trauma center is, shuts it down, gets all the traffic out, and we now have a dedicated route to bring the patients to the hospital. Have the law enforcement guys do that. I would have never thought of it. It worked great. Within 20 minutes, people are being transported. All of the patients were transported away from the accident scene in right around two hours, which is amazing. A superb job by the paramedics. They were taken to various area hospitals. Renown, which is our trauma center where I work, got the majority of the patients. But some significantly injured patients were taken to St. Mary's, which is a large hospital that's able to take care of just about anything. And some lesser injured patients were taken to two other smaller facilities, Renown South Meadows and Northern Nevada Medical Center. At our trauma center, when the patients arrived, they're met by a trauma specialist, an emergency doctor, nursing staff, respiratory therapist, ancillary staff, they were rapidly evaluated, stabilized, and then, depending on how sick they are, go directly to the operating room, to an ICU bed, or to a floor bed. Two hours after the first patient arrived, we had seen all of the patients, and they were all appropriately managed and put in the appropriate place. This was really well done, and we had hospitals from all over the country calling us and say, how'd you do it? How did it go so well? How did you manage this? Well, a little bit about the theory of disaster management. We're going to go back in time to an old German guy named Moltke. This isn't healthcare, this is military. He was the first general, uh, general chief of staff of the German military staff. This is a reasonable translation of something that he said. No plan survives contact with the anim enemy. He's talking about a battle plan. And the point he was making was you cannot micromanage your way out of a problem. Things get chaotic very quickly. No disaster plan survives contact with the disaster. And other places have tried to micromanage. They have these ginormous binders with every theoretical possible thing that can go wrong and how they're going to deal with it. That won't work. And a good illustration of that is I can completely change the Reno air disaster by changing one small fact. And I can do it over and over and over again. Okay. This plane, when it crashed, was on the last lap of the race. The fuel tanks are almost empty. Let's have them crash in the first lap of the race. Fuel tanks are full. Plane impacts the ground. We have a fireball. Now you have 40 or 50 critically ill patients who also are badly burned. We can't take care of that here. We're not a burn center. Burn patients require dedicated, specialized care by people who do nothing but that. In northern Nevada, if you're burned badly, we transfer you. We send you to Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, or Northern California, and we have transfer arrangements with hospitals in those areas. But I've now changed, by just changing it one fact, I've changed this whole disaster from a 
stabilize and treat to a stabilize and transfer. Whole new set of problems. Or let's have this crash happen on the last lap of the race, but let's have the plane 100 yards farther down the course. That's what, maybe a hundredth of a second difference? The plane impacts in front of the second set of grandstands where there's a third grade field trip. Now you have 40 critically ill pediatric patients. Changes everything. Pediatric patients get different injuries because their body physiology is different. You need different expertise, you need different equipment. Everything about the disaster changes. And I can do this over and over and over again. So what you want to do is you want to be flexible and adaptable. And we did that very well. I was asked after the incident, how many more patients could you have seen? I said, I have no idea. I said, I know that any system can be overwhelmed, but I'm very comfortable we could have seen two or three times as many patients with no degradation in quality of care or efficiency of care. And that's a very comforting thing, I think, for people who live in northern Nevada. So what do we learn? Well, on the hospital level, we learned that we had a good system that worked well. There were a couple things we'd like to improve. We didn't like the way we handled the media. The media ha does have an important role to play. Word needs to get out to people who aren't in the area about their friends and families who were injured. We changed some things we did with that. We now have a dedicated media wrangler who will help the media do their job. We learned that the community really steps forward when something like this happened. We had always kind of wondered, will we have enough resources? Will we have enough doctors and nurses and ancillary staff to take care of people? We had an abundance of people. We had people coming in on their days off. We had phone calls. People wanted to help. And we hadn't planned for that. So what we've done now is we've got a dedicated area immediately adjacent to the emergency department where you can come in, sign in, put your name down, what you're good at, what you do. And if you're going to stay, clipboard hangs on the wall. Or if you're going to leave, we get your cell phone number. Reno's still a small town, and we can call you and call you in. This is great. This way, if I'm taking care of a patient during a disaster and I realize, wow, this is a laceration that I can't fix, he needs a plastic surgeon, I just go back and I probably have two or three plastic surgeons who are more than willing to help. People really step forward. And that, despite what you think about the human race nowadays, people want to do the right thing. And so you want to help them do the right thing when they want to help you. And we've really, I think, got a better system for that. The last thing that we discovered was we thought we had a good plan for the families and friends of the people who were injured in the disaster. We have a very nice auditorium on the second floor of the hospital, a lot of comfortable seating, a lot of phone capability, which you need desperately when something like this happens. And they didn't want to be there. And it makes perfect sense. If I'm somewhere where my wife or someone else who I care about has been injured, I don't want to be two floors up and 100 yards down the hall. I want to be close to them. And so we've got a special area, again, immediately adjacent to the emergency department, where those people can be kept close to the people they want to be near. And I think that's good. Now, what did I take away from it? A couple of things. I uh, have to credit one of the chest surgeons when, uh, when we had the first group of patients come in, because they came in in groups, the paramedics came from the scene, then immediately went right back out, grabbed another set of patients, brought them back in. We had about five minutes or so where we had time after moving the first set of patients to the operating rooms to restock the rooms, get things cleaned up. And uh, one of the cardiac surgeons walks in and says, man, it smells like gasoline in here. And I hadn't even realized it, but I said, yeah, it does. And I thought about it a little. And when the plane crashed, the fuel that had been in the tanks vaporized and just spread over everybody who was at the scene. And what I took away from that is now I can't fill up my lawnmower without thinking about the disaster. It just kind of takes me back. And the second thing I took away was my first patient. And the paramedics brought him in. And he was a young guy about my age. And he was, uh, they didn't look very good. He had some bad injuries and he was very pale and his blood pressure wasn't very good. And the paramedics gave me the report real quickly and left because they had to go back out to the scene. And I leaned over and I, I wasn't even sure if he was awake or not. His eyes were closed and I said, Sir, I'm Dr. Mork, and you're at the trauma center in Reno. We're going to take real good care of you. And he was wide awake, and his eyes snapped open. He looked right at me, and he said, I know you will. I said, oh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and so we sedated him. We got a breathing tube in. We got a central line in, which is a big IV. We got his blood pressure stabilized, and we got his bleeding under control, and we got him in the operating room. And he did well, and he went home a few weeks later. And that made me feel good. And I've been asked to sum up what happened on that day, and it's hard to do. 
But what I said was, on that day in the desert north of Reno, some terrible things happened to a lot of people. And 30 minutes later, some wonderful things happened to a lot of people at Renown Medical Center. And I was very proud of our team. I was very honored to be a small piece of it. Thanks.